This video is going to be a little more advanced than the previous ones. We're going to be working with a Fourier series whose general form looks like this. There's going to be a lot of calculus, but I promise if you stay to the end, you'll be treated to a result that will blow you away no matter your level. So get ready because we're going to prove one of the most beautiful formulas in all of mathematics. If you're familiar with the Fourier series, then you know it's similar to a Taylor series approximation, only the Fourier series uses sines and cosines rather than polynomials. In our case, we're going to determine the Fourier series of a very simple function, x squared. We should also set a few ground rules before we begin. We'll assume the series of x squared converges in the interval from negative pi to pi, and that the function is periodic with period 2 pi. Now that we know the general form of the Fourier series and the specific function we want to analyze, x squared, our next task is to determine the Fourier coefficients, namely a sub 0, a sub m, and b sub m, which I've highlighted in blue. From this point forward, I'm just going to call them a0, am, and bm. Let's write their formulas at the top. Now I'm not going to show how these formulas are derived in this video. But the key practical takeaway about solving for these coefficients is that they tell you the amplitude of each frequency of the corresponding cosine and sine. So let's start with a0. We'll first replace f of x with x squared. And next, since x squared is an even function, we can rewrite the limits of integration from 0 to pi and double the integral. That's equal to 2x cubed over 3 pi and evaluating from 0 to pi, we get 2 pi squared over 3. And that result for the a0 coefficient can now be substituted into our Fourier series below. Our Fourier series is starting to develop. Now let's work on am. As before, we'll replace f of x with x squared. Notice that x squared times cosine mx requires integration by parts. Let's do our scratch work in this little box. u will be x squared and dv will be cosine mx dx. So du will be the derivative of u or 2x dx and v will be the antiderivative of dv, which is one over m times sine mx. Now we can substitute these values into the integration by parts formula to get the following expression. The first term is the uv term and the second is the integral v du term. It looks like we'll have to integrate the x times sine mx integral using parts one more time. We'll let u equal x and dv equal sine mx dx. Then du will be dx and v will be negative 1 over m times cosine mx. The resulting expression looks like this. Our expression for am has one integral left, but this is an easy one. The integral of cosine mx is just 1 over m times sine mx. And when we simplify, we get this. When we distribute negative 2 over m pi, we'll get the following expression. Good news, no need to simplify any further. Remember, am is a definite integral with limits from negative pi to pi, so let's evaluate and see what we get. Let's recall that our original function am was x squared times cosine x. Since x squared and cosine x are both even, so is their product. That means we can adjust our limits from 0 to pi and double the integral. When we evaluate, we get this expression. And thankfully, the sine m pi terms are both equal to 0. So now we have this expression, and after canceling the pi's, we're left with 4 cosine m pi over m squared. 
but we can simplify even further. Look at the pattern for cosine m pi. It's equal to negative 1 for odd m and positive 1 for even m. That means we don't even need cosine in our a m expression. Negative 1 to the m will do the trick. And that leaves us with our final expression for a m. After all that work, it becomes minus 1 to the m times 4 over m squared. Let's plug it into our Fourier series below. One more coefficient is left, bm. We'll replace f of x with x squared, just like we've been doing. Now, before we jump into another integration by parts marathon, let's observe a nice property that x squared times sine mx enjoys. If we let h of x equal x squared times sine mx, and if we then replace x with negative x and put a minus sign in front, we get back the same thing we get back the original h of x. That means h of x is odd. And that means the integral is equal to zero, since we're using limits of integration that are symmetric with respect to the origin. This is great news, and that little observation saved us a lot of unnecessary work. Let's stick that zero value for bm into our nearly finished Fourier series. And here it is. This is the Fourier series for x squared. Now, before we get to the main event, let's take a moment to visually appreciate what a beautiful job the Fourier series does in approximating x squared. I have x squared displayed and graphed in red. That's the function which we took the Fourier series of over the interval from negative pi to pi. Now in blue, I have the Fourier series that we derived for x squared. We're actually showing just one term of the series, and already it doesn't do a bad job matching up with x squared, does it? But now watch the short animation as we add more and more terms. Amazing. The Fourier series is essentially identical to x squared And that's only 20 terms. That's the beauty of the Fourier series. Now we're ready for the grand finale. Let's see what happens if we replace x with pi in our Fourier series expression. After we expand the sum, we're going to get the following. And after simplifying all the powers of negative 1 and the cosine expressions, which are basically equal to negative 1 for odd multiples of pi and positive 1 for even multiples of pi, we're left with this. Let's factor out the 4. And now divide both sides by 4. The left side becomes pi squared over 6. And look what we're left with, one of the most famous series in all of mathematics. Can you believe that we showed that the sum of the reciprocals of the squares of all the natural numbers from 1 to infinity is just pi squared over 6? It's like the Mona Lisa of mathematics. This, of course, is the solution to the famous Basel problem first proved by the great Leonard Euler in 1734. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a like and consider subscribing. Also, I'd love to get your feedback in the comments. Thanks for watching and see you soon.